What is up everybody? It is the end of October. We're heading into wrestling season. It's the most, second most awesome time of the year, the beginning of wrestling season. The only thing better is when state and NCAAs are all going on. That's the most exciting time. Um, man, we had crazy worlds this last week. Uh, a lot going on. But I was uh, in DC for a family trip and I made my way over to American University to talk to Coach Teague Moore. Um, Coach Moore wrestled at Oklahoma State under John Smith, was a national champ. Um, coached at a couple other schools, Clarion, um, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. And he is and has been the head coach at American for, I believe, eight years now. Um, I really enjoyed sitting down with Coach Moore. Um, we had a good talk, good conversation. We got into some really interesting things. I think you guys will find it uh, pretty entertaining. If you do find it entertaining, if you do like what we're doing, please let us know. Rate us on the wherever you get your podcast. Give us a good rating. Share it. Send it to your friends. Let them know to listen. And if you really like it, on the description, wherever you're listening to this podcast, you'll find a link to support the podcast. Um, not asking for charity or handout. It's just if I can get a few people to help us kind of support that, um, we'll give them a shout out. I'll give a shout out to anybody who uh, subscribes as a supporter to the podcast. Um, just helps me cover some of the costs of getting to the places and interviewing some people that are a little further out of our reach. Um, it makes it possible and I'd love to keep doing it for you guys. I got good feedback and I enjoy doing it and I think it's only going to get better. But anyway, I'm talking too much without a guest. So let's get to the guest. Head coach at American University, Teague Moore. Hey. And I can edit out anything. This, uh, this is going to probably happen, so I'm going to take us away from people. Because if we walk around in this sure. area, we're going to get like, right. it happens. bombarded. I understand. I understand. Coach Moore, I appreciate you having me. It's good to be here. I uh, appreciate you taking some time to walk around and talk to me. Yep. And uh, hopefully we can enjoy this beautiful day here Amen. In, uh, in D.C. I've been here for a couple days now, and uh, yesterday was a little chilly. Right. And today I bounced back, and it is beautiful outside. We're walking outside to uh, walk in here and grab a coffee. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So you guys just finished a workout? We did. We actually finished both of our workouts. So we split between lightweights and upperweights. So our upperweights went early today. They're done at 1245. Little guys come in at 1. Mm -hmm. They're done at 230. Hi, how are you? Good. How are you today? Good, good. Hi. Hi. That's, uh, I mean, is that, do you think that that's something, uh, I guess what I want to ask this is, is that something you guys have been doing for a while? Yes. Or is that and it was work? because, okay. uh, so you saw our room is small. Right. And we've grown our roster to the size that we can't put the whole team in and have a practice. Otherwise, practice would end up being three and a half, four hours. How many, how many guys do you guys carry on? We got roster? 30 on the squad okay. right now. Yes. Um, and so we basically, with the split, it's right around 14, 16 in a practice. Mm -hmm. And I'm going um, with the Splenda as well. Yeah. Yeah. So th that gives us the chance. Well, one, it allows us as coaches. So we have four coaches in each workout, and that allows more eyes to be on the guys. Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah. Right. And um, I couldn't agree with more with what you're saying. That's, yeah. I'm taking it all in. It's not, it's not out of design. It's completely out of necessity. Well, I think that that's right. a lot of, uh, I think that that's a lot of the attributes that, uh, I'm going to step back for a second and say this again in a better way because I'm going off in a way that may not make sense. I think that that's what is great a lot of times about wrestling is that we're oftentimes not given maybe the best um, facilities or the best resources and you become resourceful and you become that grit, that resilience that's right. like, well, I'm going to figure out a way to do it. Yeah. And, and that's the only way, I think, to do it. Um, and you good? You good? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Have a good one. Um, you know, it, it's funny that you say that because my time at, you know, my time at Oklahoma State or Oklahoma, mm -hmm. 
we had facilities big enough and sure we didn't have to worry about those things. Right. But my time at Harvard when I was at Pitt in 2000, 2001, um, Clarion. Yeah. You always seem to have to endure these sort of things. Right. Right. And it as a coach. You can do one of two things. You can pout about it and go to your AD and complain, and then wrestling gets kind of a bad rap, right? Right, right? Or you just find a way to make it work, and if you do find a way to make it work, then there's some positives that come out of it. Like I said, there's more coaches in each Absolutely. workout. So it's Absolutely. a smaller group, more coaches' eyes on the guys, more one-on-one -on -one attention. Right. And so that's kind of the way that we look at it from a coaching staff is saying, we got a better chance of seeing what the guys are doing in the smaller group setting. It's tougher on us because we're in the room almost four hours a day. Right. Right. But we also know our guys very well. Absolutely. We know each Absolutely. individual, where he's progressing, how he's progressing. So it's a positive. I, I agree. And that's, you know, with running a private club, it's very easy from a, you know, from a capitalism perspective right. to go, I got to fill this room. Sure. And I'm gonna quality. I'm gonna keep stacking them in until I physically can't hold any more in here. Yep. And I think that that is a problem of short-term thinking. Right. That I think that you know my my quality would suffer if I took that approach. And I've told people multiple times that you know we have sporadic days right now. We're only in our just started our fourth year, so we've only been around for about three years. Okay. And we sporadically throughout you know in the spring and in the fall when it, our busier times, we'll fill the room to where it's too full. Right. But it's just an individual practice here or there. And I've told people that if we can get a room like that all the time, I will gladly make an extra practice, and I'll gladly come in another two hours. Like, right. it doesn't matter to me. I mean, this is what I'm doing. This is what I want to do. So <laughs> I'll be in the rest. Wrestling room is more enjoyable, and the time goes by much faster than any other right. place anyway. You're probably going to see that by being able to focus on those individuals they're going to see the success, which ultimately is going to bring more numbers. Right. And then you'll adjust as you begin to grow and have success. Oh, I didn't care. Um, I was like, yeah. From my like, perspective, like, from a college coaching perspective, sure. I love the fact that these academies are all over the country now. And you're seeing, at our national tournaments, you're seeing places that weren't historically wrestling hotbeds. Kids are now succeeding, right? Yep. Whether you're looking yep. at the yep. South or the Southwest. Yep. Um, up into the Northeast. These were not historical wrestling sure. areas, but now they're starting to find right. success because people are invested. Club owners or academy owners are invested and the kids are starting to find individual success. Which way are we going? Let's go, um, let's go this way and just find a bench that we can okay. chill out. Yeah. And that way we'll be, so this is our quad, this is our main campus. Okay. As you can see, we're under major construction. Sure. We're building an $85 million science center right now. And so, they got a lot of stuff torn, torn up. But the one thing about AU, in my eight years here, we've been in a project or a building phase for eight years, different projects. They do an exceptional job that when this stuff gets done, it gets done right. And it helps take our campus to the next level. I mean, it's so. a beautiful campus already. Is uh, you know, it's yeah. kind of, I don't know how to describe it to, you know, because as you referenced earlier, you've been on a bunch of different campuses, and yeah. you think about like Oklahoma is much more sprawling and spread out sure. than this. Sure. But this is a beautiful campus, but at the same time, it's not in a downtown. Um, Most people think we're an urban campus, like a concrete campus, because mm -hmm. when people say, where are you at? We're in DC, they think, oh, it's concrete all over. Well, we're up out of the way. We're two and a half miles from the White House, but you wouldn't know it when you're on campus because you're on you're in a bubble, right? And it took me 15 minutes to get here from close to the White House. Yeah. So yeah, it wasn't DC it wasn't a short right. two and a half <laughs> miles either. Uh, I'm not complaining by any stretch either. Right. Uh, just helping paint the picture for mm -hmm. those of you listening. Um, but yeah, so keep going. What are you talking about the no, about so, the clubs? So the, I, I just feel like the sport in our country is in a really good place right now. Whether it was MMA that kind of catapulted us to a new level, the NCAA championships now being really done on a professional level, people are seeing a different side of the sport of wrestling. We're no longer that like redheaded stepchild of sports. <laughs> right. People are seeing this done right on a professional level. It looks really good. It's, it, we have 
we've really been able to show what it does for an individual. And whether it's stories of, you know, kids with handicaps that are wrestling and, and finding success, right. or it's the individual from a small area that brings a lot of attention because of him being the wrestler that he is. Our yes. example was the Terrell brothers. When right. David Terrell made All-American, Hawaii doesn't have that many. Right. And so the whole state gets behind that guy. Sure. Right? And it changes their view of what wrestling is. I would liken that to the Conor right. McGregor, McGregor phenomenon. Yes. With the small island, you know. Really, really good example. Um, it's just, there's, there's a lot of probably, there's a lot of successful people probably from Hawaii, just like there yeah. is from Ireland. But it's a whole other thing to be successful in something that not many people are successful in. Yeah. And that most people, regardless of how they view the sport, would, would readily admit the dedication, the sacrifice, and the work ethic that it takes. I mean, everybody in your high school and in your college growing up always is like, oh, the wrestlers, you guys are crazy. Like, even if they don't <laughs> like it and they don't watch it, they know, right? The statement that always <laughs> follows you wrestlers. Yep. Uh, Without fail. Uh, but, yeah, that's, that's a good point, too, that I haven't really considered. Um, I know you touched a little bit on the MMA, and with my academy, I've been surprised how many both ways. So I have, I have a handful of kids that through MMA got serious about wrestling. Right. And I also have a handful of kids that through wrestling realize they have a leg up on most people that want to do MMA. If they're yeah. 16, 17 years old and they've been wrestling since they were five, uh, they realize that they go to an MMA gym and those guys can't stop them from taking them down. Right. Like, ah, oh, man, I might be pretty good at this. It's become the premier background for the, for the entire MMA field. If you sure. have a good, solid wrestling background, you immediately put yourself in an advantage. You know? what, do you, what do you think it is? Because I have my thoughts about that, and I think we probably agree on a lot of it, but what do you think that that is about that? Uh, well, at this point in time, and this may change 10 years from now, but I feel like the guys that have been brought up in the sport of wrestling, you've, you've had to have been gritty for quite a while. Sure. To stay with the sport, right. where the sport is at this time, um, you get you get a lot of individuals that um, they've been brought up and they're doing it for the right reasons. They're doing it because they're passionate about the sport. They've been in a wrestling room and they've been beat up or choked out, or you know, they've just gone through those really, really grueling, tough practices again and again and again. And there wasn't the pep rallies at their high school there wasn't mm -hmm. a fanfare from their town like there is for other sports mm -hmm. so these guys have gone through it now they get a stage like mma to come out onto and man they sure now you put money right. in front of them the extrinsic values get thrown in Absolutely. and that, the, when their foundation is built on the intrinsic yeah. rewards that's where i feel we have the advantage because sure. our guys have been put through the ringer by the time you get through ncaa wrestling which the majority of those guys have mm -hmm. You've seen it all. You've kind of done the dance, and, and you didn't do it for fanfare. Mm -hmm. You did it because you loved it and you were passionate about it, and I think that gives you an advantage in MMA. Sure, um, sure. Now I, that I think another thing that a parent brought up to me uh, that's an MMA guy, was, was and I had not considered this previous, was uh, the structure. Yeah. That there's not, like if you go into jiu-jitsu, which would you know, be another grappling background that you could do MMA with, there's just not, like, you can't go out for your high school's jiu-jitsu team. Correct. And you can't wrestle a full schedule where you get 30 to 50 matches in a four-month period in jiu-jitsu. That's, jiu -jitsu. A, that's and, a really good point. And uh, he said that, that, he's like, that's why we came to wrestling, because it's like, we can learn all the jiu-jitsu after we learn wrestling is what he figured out. And he's like, they're going to practice and get way more hours in here, because any gym I go to jiu-jitsu is going to be a two- to three-day-a-week class, yep. which is good. But that four months of five to six days a week, in there working 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 competing testing yourself well now it's not even four to five months guys like yourself and in kids that are wrestling freestyle sure it's 11 months out of the right. year you know right. it's, it's crazy yeah. it's one of those things that i look at my son and i'm like i get a little leery i get nervous i'm like man if if and when is he gonna push into wrestling how much do you push him eric guerrero and i were just on a trip to the to the junior world together and his son is is coming into his own in the sport and that was something we talked about is like when when do we introduce them to and then how far do you introduce mm -hmm. them to them come on we have world championships for eight-year-olds now i right. think it's a little silly 
a little silly. Silly. Uh, and probably gives the kids the wrong view of the sport. Sure. But at the end of the day, as far as you want to take it now, you can go. Right. You can train 12 months out of the year with good coaching, good competitions, um, regular competitions. Families can now look at the calendar and say, here's where we want to be four months from now, six months from now, eight months from now. So there is a lot of structure with it. For sure. And that's uh, something that we've come into a lot. And I've tried to figure it out because out of college, I went straight to coaching high school. And I coached high school for five years. was pretty successful at that just not that's not a pat on my back um i always tell people about this that i feel like i'm a pretty good coach but only for the mere fact of that i've been very fortunate to be around people who are really smart and really good at what they do and i was somehow smart enough to shut my mouth and open my ears and like listen to a few things and go oh that's pretty good i think yeah. i'll take that yeah. um but for me where i have the least amount of experience is with the youth but the good thing is is that i already knew going ahead of time how i wanted to do it so right. instead of going in and going, well, I'm going to let the the crowd kind of guide me because that would have been a bad move is what I figured out right. really quickly. Is, right. Like you mentioned, the way that things trend is, you know, a lot of it's driven by capitalism, which I think is a good thing ultimately, but you have to be wary of what you're doing. You have to have an ethic or a moral compass of some kind. You can't just make everything about the next dollar. Yeah. And I think that that's where we've gone somewhat is – and you'll hear, like, I, I talk to guys who are in my field, which is running a, you know, a private club, and how many times I've heard the phrase that the youth, the youth numbers is what keeps your lights on. Yep. And that, that, to me, like, breaks my heart because I feel like that group of people, when I'm, and, and I'm talking specifically just for clarity, is the five, six, seven, eight-year-old range is where I'm talking. Um, that, that group right there, I think, should have the least barriers of entry that we can afford to make. Correct. So it should be the cheapest classes. It should be the least amount of commitment. It should be the the most fun. It should be all of those things. And I've just seen so many kids that are pushed into competition so quickly without the proper tool set. Like, right. They don't have any skill sets to use other than knowing a stance. Right. And so what ends up happening is you get two kids that stay in a stance for 30 seconds circling each other until one of them gets brave enough to try to grab the other one by the head and who falls on who is who wins. And I'm just like, I get, I, I mean, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on it is that because there certainly is benefit to that, right? Yeah. In most cases, you're, there's benefit to the fact that you're going out and it's uncomfortable and you don't really probably want to do it and it's nerve wracking and it's scary, but you go do it anyway. But to me, I feel like that that's a lesson that cognitively doesn't need to be learned that early. Like right. I think that your your brain is still pliable enough at eight, nine, and ten years old to learn those same lessons then and actually probably understand them quicker and more in depth. Yep. Um, at that age. Absolutely agreed. Uh, my thoughts on it are now I came up. This is interesting because I came up in Western Pennsylvania. Right. Right. Growing up in Pittsburgh, where it is. My college roommate went to Pittsburgh Central, by the way. Oh, okay. So, so I'm sure he can attest to the fact that like. In Western Pennsylvania, you're grinding. Mm-hmm. You're grinding really early. Now, we've produced at a really high level and, and done really well. And I'm sure if you talk to any Pittsburgher in the last 20 years, 30 years, they could probably give you 10 or 15 names of kids that are better than the Coleman Scotts, Jake mm-hmm. Herberts, Teague Moores, laundry list of names, sure. right? That never made it to the next stage right. because they got they got jammed so hard so early right. that they got burned out, sure. right? Sure. Um, I do think that there is a little bit of a shift in that people now see the value in that there's been a lot of wrestlers now study the ways that the, the system that the Russians mm-hmm. use, right? Mm-hmm. And teaching their kids body control, body awareness at a young age, almost like the gymnastics introduction. Mm-hmm. So now a kid can stand on one foot or he can do a standing back flip or he can do a bridge kick over. He can control himself. Then they introduce the wrestling phase. Yes. Him, right? Whereas I know when I started 30 years ago, 37 years ago. It's crazy to think like practice. that, huh? Yeah, we went to practice and it was pretty much match up and coach was blowing the whistle and you were doing mm-hmm. a single leg and you were grabbing that kid's head. And you know, there was just like, there was the craziness aspect of it. Saturday tournaments from seven in the morning till seven at night. Your family had to be fully committed sure. to the sport, yes. right? 
and there's a lot of us, myself included, we're really blessed because our parents made that commitment early and we survived through the system. Right. Right. Now, when I look at my son, I don't know that, I don't know that that's the system I want him to go through. Sure. Right. Yeah. Because I saw too many kids by the end of high school that mm. were just burned and they had an incredible talent. Absolutely. But they just said, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to go anywhere. Sure. Right. Yeah. I, and you bring up a good point because um, I've just, it's kind of a little off topic, not off topic. Uh, I was having a conversation with a parent the other day and with the way we break up our age group classes is five to nine and then right. 10 and older. Okay. So his, his question was, are you concerned that some of your nine-year-olds that you're forcing to stay in the younger class right. may be holding them back and you may lose people because of that. And I said, you have to define concern because concern would be that I'm stressed in some way about it. Right. And I'm not really. Right. But I do acknowledge that's going to happen. Right. But I said, here's, here's the two choices I have is I can either push all of them to the point that I know it's not good. And what's going to happen is one of those kids is going to make it through yep. and he's going to be tough as nails. Yep. And that might make me look pretty good. Right. But what about the other 20 over the last 10 years that I've lost? That they get, said, yeah. Here's, here's the difference, though. If I, if I do it the way that I believe is correct, I most certainly, 100%, without a doubt, guarantee that I will have people who say, you're not pushing my kid hard enough, we're going to go somewhere else. But right. guess what? They're going to go somewhere else and keep wrestling. Right. And that's fine. Like, that's fine. I'll lose a kid to a different club. But the sport's not losing a kid. The sport's not losing the kid, yep. right? And that's when I set out and opened this thing, I wrote it down on a piece of paper. And I wrote a hierarchy of who comes first, right? And it's like integrity, morals, everything that I believe in how you should live your life is number one. Number two is the sport. Right. Number three is the, the individual student that doesn't come above the sport, right? No individual kid comes before the sport. Right. Uh, and I mean that in, gar in regards of, like we were just mentioning, like I'm not going to take a kid and go, oh man, I... I see that this kid could be unbelievable. I'm going to push him so hard right now because I got to get him to the next level because that's not what's best for the sport. It's not what's best for him. And then myself comes down there yep. after that, right? Yep. Um, so with that, and I think that this is something I picked up really big and we talk about in our academy, I picked up from sports psychologists, was how much easier it is to make decisions if you've predetermined your values and your goals. Yep. And and it's so easy to just go back to that so and go, agreed. which... Which decision do I make? Well, it's easy. I just look at my what I said is important to me, what I value, right? And if integrity is number one on there, then it's usually pretty obvious which choice you should make. To take that from the, you're dealing with it at the youth level, right? You're seeing it and, and your day-to-day -day is there. I'm dealing with it on college level. I literally just had a guy this morning walk in to the office which after I want the to know morning workout. Because I'm, a, I, I'm taking a position in 2019 with a college. Okay. So. I'll be working from four-year-olds through 23 Now, years. here's so the I'm, one thing. Tell I'll, me about I'll, it. I'll preface this. If you talked to the other 76 Division One head coaches, right. you're probably not going to find very many guys that have the same philosophy that I do. I would but agree with my that. philosophy. I would agree it. with that. Kid walks in after the morning run this morning. Mm -hmm. We're still a couple of weeks away from the start. He's done the work with preseason. He's busted his butt, but he comes in and says, Coach, really been thinking a lot about this lately. Talk to my parents about it. Talk to my high school coach about it. I don't think I want to do this anymore at this level. And I said, is this something you're thinking about today? And he says, no, I've been thinking about this for four weeks. Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, what your next step, if you choose to step away from wrestling, are you completely done? He says, well, no, I still want to, still, I'm still going to follow it. I'm going to watch it. How can you, if you don't want to wrestle on this team, how can you still be involved with the sport and be around with the program? Yeah. This is how I've ended up with my best videographers. Right. This is how I've ended up with guys that help me write our newsletters. Sure. Guys that help our SID get things done for our program. They already know the intimacy of the sport. They know the language of the sport. Right. They know what tournaments count, which wins count. They know it all. So now, and especially at a place like American, where these kids are kids are pretty smart right right so now i got a kid that already has the wrestling knowledge base he just doesn't want to do the grind anymore sure i can appreciate that and the other thing i don't want to do 
is drag him along, right? right? Because I've learned, unfortunately, the hard way. You drag him along and say, I don't want you to quit. Keep coming in. Keep right. coming in. He gets his. He's getting pounded in practice every day. There's no fun in it, no. right? He Especially when you up, already didn't want to be there to begin with. Like he ends up disliking the sport even more, right. right? So now those are the type of guys I say, okay, if you want to step away from the team, I'm good with it. Is our relationship still good? Mm-hmm. How can you maybe still, whatever passion you do have for the sport, how can you give back? Right. And again, I found my best videographers, I found my best writers, the guys that help me yeah. in the office. I just come to find out that sometimes college wrestling D1 isn't built sure. for everybody, right? right? It, there's a crazy statement. Yeah, D1 right. college wrestling isn't built for everybody. Right. But these guys, um, they can be great ambassadors of our sport. And I learned by watching over the years that sometimes coaches either ridiculing or downgrading the kids because they didn't want to do this anymore ended up being a really bad thing for our sport. So at this point in time, I have that take of, you know what, I get it, you want to move on. And your, your example of... That kid wants to go at the. He wants to go to a club where they are grinding. I'm. I'm not grinding enough. I haven't run into those situations where somebody comes to me and says, "I want to transfer and go to school sure. X Y Z sure. because you're not pushing me hard enough." I haven't had that experience yet. It may come now that these transfer, these crazy transfer yeah. rules are in. But I've dealt with the other end where kids say, "Coach, I'm just." I don't have a passion for mm-hmm. it anymore. Okay, I'm fine sure. with it. How do we find a way to keep you involved in the sport? Because sure. this sport, as far as I'm concerned, this sport is growing at an extremely fast pace. Mm-hmm. So if this kid wrestled for 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, and chooses to step away while he's here at American, he's eventually going to leave here, get a job. He's going to move somewhere that probably needs a youth coach, right. a club coach. Mm-hmm. How can he still enjoy the sport and learn to give back? Yeah, and, and probably... And to elaborate even more, because I think you brought up a good point there, is uh, lots of good points, by the way. But the end one that that uh, not only is he going to move to an area, but most likely he's going to have a family. He's going to have a kid that wants to wrestle, and at least now you you have a much more understanding because yep. you've been around. I mean, you and I both know this. If if a kid spent four years at a Division One program, even as a videographer, that had a wrestling background. He's going to be way more readily equipped to coach a youth club Absolutely. than a dad that wrestled in high school. Absolutely. And high school only, right? And not to knock those guys because a lot of them volunteering and doing great stuff. That's not a, a knock at all. But just like you said, I, and I never really have thought about it. Like I've thought of things in that term, I guess. But like that specific, um, particularly with the different settings. With yeah. the high school, it's like I'm trying to fill the lineup. And if I got a kid going... I don't think I want to do this anymore. I'm trying to get him to stay on the team because yes. we, need, because he, I have to consider him, right? And in high school, I got a lot more kids that wanted to quit just because they'd rather go do other things. It wasn't that they didn't like wrestling. Wrestling was getting in the way of their social life. Sure. And you couldn't you couldn't get them to understand that like this is a temporary thing that you'll see is not that important in the future compared yeah. to what you're getting here. And then you get the the generation of parents now that are like, well, I can't make him go. I'm like. Yeah, you can. Actually, you're the parent. You, you can. can make them go. You can if you no, really want to. No, I'm not saying that's to. always the best answer. Right. But, like, if you're just talking about whether you can or you can't. Right. And nowadays, we have way more things to take away from them. Yeah. To make them go. Yeah. Uh, so true. But as a, as a new dad, I'm, I'm trying to figure all that stuff out now and think ahead. But it's so hard to think ahead because the world changes so quick now. It's like, yeah. by the time I'm dealing with those issues, I'm going to have way other things that we don't even know about. Right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Competing with and and trying to figure out but uh and you were talking a little bit about your how old your son so he's nine right now Mm -hmm. he has a twin sister that's also nine and then i have an 11 year old girl and a 13 year old girl okay so it's three girls one boy um my 11 year old my oldest never tried wrestling never did it right um she's into she runs cross country plays soccer and does drama the 11 year old daughter has now wrestled two seasons we have in dc we have a really good introductory league uh-huh. okay it's run by a guy named michael lerner that was an, an alumni of au okay runs a very successful um construction company okay. right builds homes so he developed a league i guess it's 15 or 20 years ago helen marolas came up through okay. his league right the 
the way that it's structured is two nights a week, you go to your little club, there's 12 of them, you go and do your two hour practice twice a week. On Saturdays, he's got one high school every set, it's at that high school every Saturday. Your club shows up during a two hour window. Mm -hmm. Your kids are guaranteed one or maybe two matches and they pair them up by weight and by like ability. So I might be wrestling a kid that's 11 and I'm only eight, but if he's seven and oh, and I'm oh and seven, we're not gonna go head to head. But if he's four and three and I'm three and four, we're gonna match up. So this, the area that we're in, Bethesda, Maryland, large white collar population, Mm -hmm. right? Parents can't commit to the 7 a.m tournament that goes until 7 sure, p.m. or right. 9 p.m. So Michael developed a league that allows you to know every Saturday it's a two-hour window. You're either in 11 to 1 or 1 to 3. Right. They bring all the clubs together, mix the kids up. So every Saturday you're seeing different kids and right. getting competition. You're guaranteed one to two matches. You're in and you're out. Right. I love it. Sure. For my kids, this area that we live, and I, and I think this is true of a lot of uh, urban areas around the country, my kids can do any sport they want. Yeah. If I want them to get introduced to soccer at a very elementary level, I have that. If I want the seven day a week club, I have that available, sure. right? If I want my nine year old daughter, Jim did, did gymnastics for four years. She was in what they call their developmental age and, and she was kind of handpicked to move up quickly because right. they saw she sure. might have aspirations. They had her training 12 hours a week at six right it was way over the top and this past summer she just said mom and dad i don't want to do this anymore and we said that's cool sure right um so in terms of the wrestling introductory level i feel like we're at the right place and michael's got the right organization not everybody has something like that at their fingertips if we want to go to the next level and do the tournaments every saturday and find the club that trains three four days a week we have it right but i just Sure. Having to, right. Kids don't have that passion yet. Right. Right. And I'm a firm believer in that when the kids want it, take them to it. Mm-hmm. If they don't want it at that level, don't push. Mm-hmm. Right. Because it may end up turning them away from Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Right. That's, so I may not end up with a wrestler. <laughs> right. Right. In my kids. But at the end of the day, if they're happy with what they're doing, my wife and I's agreement are that they have to be active. Right. They're, they swim and dive all summer long. They run, all four of them run cross country in the fall, which led into winter for three of them the last two years, right? Last year. Um, and then springtime, we start to get into our soccers and some of the other sports, and then right. it leads back into swim and dive. Okay. So as long as they're active, that's our thing. You right. gotta be on the team, yes. you gotta learn how to be a teammate, you gotta learn how to be coached. I struggle with that one because my kids sometimes are not coachable. Right. And I'm sitting on the sidelines watching them not listen, right. not pay attention, and my head, like, goes to explode right uh and so but those are times that we get in the car and i say why were you not listening to coach oh well so and so was doing this and i was distracted or what and i'm like whoa (laughs) you're in practice and when you're in practice you are fully attentive to coach right and if they ask you to do a b or c i don't want to hear you don't want to you're in practice and you're on the team if coach asks you to do something you do it if your teammates not listening I don't care. Right. You get over there and do it, yeah. right? So that's where some of my upbringing in Pittsburgh starts to come out. I have to be careful with it. Because um, my family was like, we were a wrestling family. Sure. Right? Yeah. And when you went to practice and coach blew the whistle and it was time to go, you go. There yeah. was no sure. anything else besides that. It made us very tough. Right. right? My one of my older brothers, Tommy, ended up wrestling at App State. Got mm-hmm. a scholarship to go to App State. My brother Ty, four-time Pennsylvania State champ, went to North Carolina. I got the chance to go to Oklahoma State. Right, so we were we benefited from the culture and the resources that were offered in Western Pennsylvania, and it allowed us to do something our parents never did. We got to go to college because of the right. sport of wrestling. Right. I don't know that my brothers or I would have gone to college had we not had wrestling in the opportunities sure. it presented, yeah. right? I might have been like other friends I had in Pittsburgh that finished high school and went off and did other things, right, mm-hmm. outside of college. And th- looking back on it, 
you know, I wonder where my life would be if I didn't have right. the sport of wrestling right. that gave us the vehicle to move forward. I just know that my parents were completely dedicated to us kids. Mm -hmm. They were extremely hardworking, fully committed. My dad never graduated high school. He went right. right into the military. My mom finished high school, didn't go to college, but they impressed upon all seven kids, you need to get an education, right? And, and that was their wish and want for us. Wrestling became our vehicle to do it. Yeah. My two sisters, they were extremely smart, right? Um, unlike their brothers. Uh, they were smart, went to college, did their own thing, became a uh, registered nurse and an and, and accountant. So we, they, our family was, uh, we were fortunate to have parents that saw the value in education, sure. pushed their kids toward it. The sons, the boys, we were just fortunate that wrestling was that vehicle. Right. Yeah, I think that similar for me in that, I, you know, you hear something so much that you just think, that it's true without questioning it, but you don't really ever contemplate it in any way. And for me, that was the call. Like you got to go to college. You got to go to college. It's like, yeah. well, I know I got to go to college because that's what I've heard since I was four years old. Right. But then all of a sudden, next thing I know, I'm in college, and I'm like, I better start like making something <laughs> of this because I'm here now. <laughs> this and might all be I've been working quick. on is wrestling. Like, <laughs> right. And uh, right. and that ended up actually coming to bite me a little bit. It, I mean, obviously, I feel like, uh, and something I was thinking about while you're talking about that is it's it's very difficult to have regrets. Be, unless you're just in a bad situation, right? Yeah. But like, I'm happy with my life right now, so I, I, it's hard to think back and go, well, I, I probably should have done this. I mean, when I look at everything that I have and where I'm at, I mean, I met my wife at Mizzou, so I have my daughter, so it's right. like hard to regret going there. Right. Um, and a little bit about me from there is that I actually walked on to Mizzou um, as a preferred walk-on, I guess, that, uh, you know, one of those guys that I, I was not being recruited because I didn't wrestle year round. I was a three sport athlete all four years of high school. Um, and then my, I, I just, I played everything all growing up. And then my sophomore year, um, I, I made the finals of state tournament. And after that point, like it, it started to become something that I took much more serious. Right. But I didn't make that jump to fully wrestling year round yet. So I wasn't being recruited by anybody. Um, multiple time finalist, state champ, but not being recruited heavily other than your, you know, we have, St. Louis has a lot of really good, um, at the time, NAIA, now D2, with like McKendree and uh, Lindenwood, some smaller schools. Uh, Missouri Valley is in, in uh, Missouri Baptist. We have a lot of smaller schools there. Um, and I was being recruited by, uh, by most of them. But to me, it was like, well, all I saw it was was agreeing to the next five years committed to wrestling right. and going to school, obviously. So I thought my worst nightmare, and this is the way that I think is maybe messed up, but my worst nightmare would be that I go to an NAI D3, D2 school and I do really well. Then all I would wonder is like, man, how and could I have done it at that next? And yeah. I was like, well, I only got one shot of this. I'm going big or I'm going home. Yep. And I thought I can always leave Mizzou and go to one of these schools, like yep. not to lessen them, but it's just, I had seen it happen. You know right. I mean? I see multiple guys go to go there and just, you know, a year or two there, they realize they're not going to start. They're behind somebody that, uh, one of my best friends that lives in St. Louis with me now, um, Joey Garrity, we came in and we were two years behind Ben and he was a 74 pounder. Well, you know, two years in, he realizes like, <laughs> I'm going to get one shot at this when Ben graduates and that's about right. it. And he ends right. up blowing out his knee that year. But he's a doctor now, so right. he doesn't care about that. I mean, he does, I'm sure, but he's very happy to be a doctor. He has a great family. But anyway, um, I don't know where I was going with that, but I, I just, something that I was going to ask you about too, it, it, that I thought about while you were talking about that was some characteristics that you, you were mentioning. Um, and I've got in this debate, and I don't know if you can call it a debate because I don't know where I stand on it. Just more of a curiosity is how many traits within many of us are given to us by wrestling and how much of it is we pursued wrestling because of those traits? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, wow. Because I think, you know, for me and where I was thinking of an example is that I seem to recognize in myself that for whatever reason, I'm more inclined to choose the more difficult path most of the time. Right. And I don't know if that's something that has developed over time 
or if that's something that I kind of had in me all along and that's why I kind of took wrestling. I would say that it's initially there are there, there are certain character traits or qualities within individuals that they once they experience the sport they say ooh I like that right the individual out valley mm-hmm. you put the work in and you yes. now get your hand raised and people recognize that you put the work in right, right. so there there's the payoff factor and you're not standing there with a team of individuals and they're kind of like well, did you really contribute to the team win, right? And I think wrestling offers that. But I think it definitely shifts for most of us. This would just be my opinion, initial, without even sure. put a ton of thought into it. I think that once we get into the sport, the sport, the sport kind of hooks us. And then once you start going down the path and you start really looking to succeed at this, the sport ends up growing those attributes and character qualities into us. Interesting, the, yes. the path yeah less chosen mm-hmm. I think is a very common extremely common trait you line up let's just take the 80 NCAA All-Americans sure I guarantee you ask them or their family or the people around them and go does this dude normally choose the path less chosen and the tougher road because it's a tougher road and probably all 80 are going to raise their hands and their mom and go, dad go, oh yeah, totally bullheaded. Like, yeah. <laughs> he's actually looking for the toughest place right. that nobody else is going to go and then he attacks it right. go on. So I think that is something that the sport, it's something that we have in us at the beginning, but then the sport really forces you to start to go down that path. Right. Because let's face it, if you want to be a state champion, if you want to be uh, successful on the national level, you actually have to start to get a little crazy. Right? Oh, yeah. You have to start to like the two-hour grind practices. Yep. Think about this. I, I, One thing, and it's just because I have this trait now, I realized it after I was coming out of wrestling, people that are OCD, yeah. right? Wrestling really hones in on those people. Yeah. Or those people hone in on wrestling. I don't know which is which. Sure. If you walk into a room... And you said, we're just working on single leg today, and we're going to hit 500 of them. Most normal people would say, thanks, but no thanks. I'm going to go get <laughs> right. some coffee. Right. right. Most wrestlers go, oh, yeah, this is cool. Right. I'm going to spend the next two hours working on one specific position and doing it over and over and over and sure. over and over until I can't get it wrong. Right. right. So there has to be some of these character qualities and traits that are in us, but then the sport, if you really want to become exceptional, you have to actually start to like these things, right. which are not normal, right. right? I'm sure you see it in other sports. I haven't spent enough time around swimmers, but I got to believe that swimmers have these same sort of intrinsic values sure. because you're swimming up and down in a pool of water. How much can you change practice? It's terrible. Right? Like I couldn't think of anything worse to do. Hours <laughs> on end, tens of thousands of calories, yeah. right? Yeah. You got to be a little different, yeah. right? So. I think that's something that our sport in in wrestlers, coaches, specifically when you're recruiting, you start seeing that in kids. Sure. You don't even have to know the kid yet, but if you go to a tournament and you get 10 college coaches that are standing around four mats, they're going to watch all these kids wrestle and you're going to see eight of those coaches gravitate to one kid that they don't even know who he is, but when they're watching him wrestle, they're going, he's got that it factor, right? right? That you can see he's got that repetitive, hard-nosed nature, that gritty nature um, that ends up coming out and makes you successful in this sport. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, that's a great point because I think that it's kind of maybe one of those things that I, uh, and this analogy is used a lot, the iron sharpens iron, you know, and and the forging of steel. And I think that if you think of, um, I don't know, I'm going to be talking about something I really don't know about, but I'm going to sound really dumb. But the, uh, are they called katanas? The Japanese swords for the samurai? Yes. I don't know that that's a specific name because I'm not very smart. Obviously. Well, the, <laughs> but we're going to say that okay, is the name. Okay, so, so there's, there's an ancient art to how they fold and bend and temper the steel yep. correctly, right? And if it's too hot or cools too quickly, I don't know what I'm talking about. But I know something about that is right. What, that Changes this, the molecular structure of the, right, the metal right. that makes it stronger, more rigid, and able to hold the blade. Now. Sure. So... So what I hear when you're talking about that is that what what you started with in this hunk of metal that you forged this blade out of had all of whatever it needed to either be brittle and be terrible sword or to be flexible and durable and hold its edge. 
right? So it's like, it has the, it has everything it needs to be either of those things. Right. It just depends on which, which, in, who's, whose whose hands are you in, in fire, right? Yeah. Or do you use it as is and just try to sharpen it? Exactly. Right. It's so a really good example. And I think that that's uh, you know a lot of things are cliche for a reason, right? They're cliche because they're right and they work. And it's and one of my my assistant coach he always says this is that no true progress comes within the comfort zone. And I think that friction and stress are vital to any improvement. And that's wrestling, business, school, academics, anything. Parenting. Yes. And I think that that's, and, and we've seen it a little bit with the, uh, I guess, I don't know, Angela Duckworth, have you heard of her? Um, she kind of was one of the, I, I'm again going to sound like an idiot here too, because I don't know that much about her. I know a little bit, but I, she was one of the big names coming out probably about three or four years ago that were leading this within education, um, the idea of, of being gritty, right? And being resilient. And that we're focusing too much on the wrong things. Right. And that's helped guide me a ton as a coach is that, again, setting my priorities, right? So like what, I can only focus on so many things, particularly in the setting where I'm at, like we run practice three days a week. So year round, unless we have a tournament that weekend, three days a week is all I get them. Right, and that's, I just don't have people that will commit to four or five days a week. Um, so it, I do have them year round, but it's not, I don't have the hours that I had when I was on the high school program where you have them for four or five, six days a week. Right. Um, so it's like, I gotta maximize what I'm focusing on. I, and I don't have enough time to focus on everything. So what's gonna yield me the most results in the most areas without isolating other things? Like, what is, what is something that I can focus on that's inclusive of the other things I wanted to learn, even right. if I'm not teaching them specifically. Right. And the resilience and the grit and the attitude and the mental, uh, you know, environment, like where you're at mentally, your mindset and how you think about things for me has yielded me the best results without having to go into individual things. Like kind of, it's kind of like how I think of it is what we talked about earlier is if my kids know the values right. that are important, it makes it easier for them to make the right decisions. Absolutely. And, and when I said that, it, it sounded more of the like high school kids, you know, making the right decision, like stay out of trouble, do the right thing. I'm talking about even in your practices, like yep. whether you decide to hit one more rep, like when coach says, bring it in and you're in the middle of the shot, do you finish it or do you just let go and stop? Right. Like I'm not going to go around addressing every single one of those every single time. It doesn't mean I'm never going to address it. Like if I see a kid do it, I'm going to let him know. Yeah. But the idea is that if I set you up with what is should be important, then you should be able to have the ownership over your own decisions, and it should mean that much more and be that much more effective for you. Absolutely. And then on top of that, you get into every kid's different. So like the way that I say it may not work for them, but if they know the idea of what's important, then they come up with their own analogy in their head. They come up with their own example right. and reason to do it and, and reasoning why they should do it, right? Right. Because we all, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of this more than probably anybody is. I can talk myself into or out of anything. Correct. I would agree with that statement. <laughs> if I, I, if I want to do it, I, I'm can, gonna find, I can justify it. I'm going to find the reasoning behind it. <laughs> Luckily, I'm, I've, I'm a pretty decent person, so those are all good things. That's a good but thing. Yep. The, the, the most applicable example I can think of is um, I wanted a motorcycle and I wanted a Jeep. Those are things I wanted since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. My parents would never let me have a motorcycle. Never right. So when I got old enough, I was like, I'm getting a motorcycle. Well, my wife didn't want me to have a motorcycle, right? So it was this, she, what she knew is that like once I decided I wanted it, it was gonna happen, right? right? And then not, no disrespect to her, and it, I wasn't disrespecting her in any way, but it was basically like, okay, where are you gonna get the money? And I was like, all right, well, I'll figure it out. How much do I need? This, like, okay, I gotta do this camp, I'll do this camp, and I, boom, I got it. And then I had my motorcycles for like, I, know, I had two different motorcycles. Because another thing I wanted to do is build a motorcycle. So I bought one okay. that was a Harley that I could ride all the time. And then I bought this one that didn't run for like $400. And I spent like four or five months re like cutting it, chopping it, painting it, moving things. Um, I think that was from when I was a little kid when uh, Orange County Choppers was really nice, big, you know? Nice, yeah. Uh, yeah. I was like, I always watched them and I was like, that's pretty cool, but it doesn't look like that complicated. Like, right. I think I could do that. Right. And I did. I mean, not as well as them by any stretch of the imagination, but I successfully did it. It was something I wanted to do. Then I had them for a few months and I realized like, 
Um, actually, unfortunately, I, I don't mean to go in a sad place, but Joe Williamson um, mm -hmm. from Float, I wrestled with him in college. He was actually, him and his brother James were my hosts on my recruiting trip. Well, his dad passed away a few years back in a motorcycle accident. Oh, wow. And after that happened, that. yeah, after that happened, I was like, do I really need motorcycles? Like, right. how much do I really need this? Right. So I got rid of those and got a Jeep. Like, that's the next best thing. Freedom of the air, much safer. Um, but when the Jeep happened, that was a whole nother, it was the cycle again. Like, where yeah. are you going to get the money for the Jeep? Yeah. Okay, well, I got to get this much for the motorcycle, so I got to get it. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm, once I decide I'm going to do it. The wheels, once they're in happen. motion, yeah. all they're going to do is pick up, it's bad. Pick up speed. Um, it's it's it, bad. Interesting stuff. That that um, hearing you say that it reminds me of a couple of things. And we we talk about this with our guys on a regular basis. Uh, I do these morning messages. Uh -huh. So when I'm driving in early in the morning, I have a pretty good commute. I got like a 35 minute commute on okay. a good day. I will film myself coming in if I have a message. Mm -hmm. I throw it up on my YouTube channel. I send it out to the team. So it's it's private, meaning that no, right. nobody can just jump on my YouTube channel because sure. I send these right. same messages to my kids. I send a message to Richard Perry every day yep. right now. So I can throw that stuff on there, throw somebody the link, and then they watch it, right? But the message that we that's reinforced on a regular basis is you can succeed or fail in whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. It's where are you going to put your mind to go? Yeah. Right. And if you want success and your mind starts to go on that path, now all you have to do is figure out the practices or the regimen on a day to day basis to keep moving towards success. Right. It's never going to be a perfect path. Right. You're going to have potholes and you're going to have detours and all of that. But getting yourself in motion and moving that way, yes. you're going to do it. Right. right. We also give the examples of if you want to be a failure, if you want to really throw your time away here at American sleep through your classes, don't get your academic work done, skip study halls, right? You'll fail. You can yeah. get on the path of right. failure and it is the same thing. It's your day-to-day -day regimen and what you're doing. Uh, the, the ingredients are there either way, like you were talking about earlier about the sword. Sure, yeah. It's all there. Right. To be successful, it's all there. To be a failure, it's all there. Mm -hmm. Be cognitive in what you're doing in your day-to-day. -day. Right. And you can go either direction. It's completely yeah. up to you. I agree. Right. So you do those every morning or I, most I, mornings? I, I do them most mornings. Um, I either come into practice because sometimes I think the message has to be face-to-face. -face. Right. They need sure. to hear me sure. saying it, right? Yep. Other times it's easier. Like I was saying earlier, our practices are split. So I don't always get the team together every mm -hmm. single day. So it's just an easy way. Technology allows me at this point right. to give them the message. They hear my words. They see my face as I'm saying it. Uh, great example. Last week, I'm coming onto campus. Little things frustrate me all the time. I think <laughs> this is another wrestling trade, right? Yes. Little things frustrate me. I'm coming onto campus, and there's a bus stop. And the quote says, people won't remember your words People won't remember your actions. They will remember how you made them feel. And I read it as I'm driving by it. I read it and I'm like, okay, I'm definitely taking this the wrong way because that quote just made me upset, right? Nick Saban, I like uh -huh. Nick Saban because yeah. he's he's a straightforward coach and I, he's ultra successful, right? And I came in and I was fired up about it. So I sent the message to the guys. I said, gentlemen, this quote is on campus. And here's just my opinion. Right. I probably have this wrong, and you guys can message me and let me know that I took the quote wrong. But if I go around every day just trying to make everybody in my life happy, I'm going to run around in circles driving myself insane because I'm trying to make everybody happy. If you show up into this practice room and I want to make you feel good and make you happy, and you hit horrible single legs and you can't take anybody down, but I go and pat you on the back every day and go, you're doing a great job. Your right. single leg is um it's a great single leg you don't take anybody down with it you don't score any points but how sure. do you feel and he says i coach i feel good about myself we go to a tournament you're gonna get smashed right right so it's that idea of like you have to make sure there's a realism in what you're reinforcing every right. day and it just so happened it was bizarro two days later nick saban has a quote out that says if you want to make people happy, don't become a leader. Sell ice cream. <laughs> That's right. 
and I sent it I just out to the saw, team I think and you, I said, I think it was on yours. I saw that. I think you shared it. How odd is this, right? <laughs> yeah. Because it's so true. Like yeah. if you want to lead people and you want to lead people in the right way, you're going to have to help them become gritty. Sure. And if in what you were saying earlier, uh, the gal's name that you were speaking of, what do I truly believe about our educational system? We're in one of the greatest countries in the world, if not the greatest. The greatest. How can our education I system would be so poor and failing in so many areas? Well, maybe the philosophy that we've been driving the ship for so long, maybe it's not the right philosophy. Mm-hmm. Right? Making life easy on kids in every way, shape, and form and plopping it in front of them isn't the way to make them Right. better people right because you said it earlier if I teach my kids that m- not only my kids my four kids at home but my athletes my kids that are coming into the room my wrestlers that are coming into the room if I instill in them that when they're drilling and they should if they do it wrong do it two times right 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 and don't walk out of the room until you do that if they start living by that when it comes time for them to move away from wrestling, and maybe it is business, maybe it is being a parent, maybe it is how they're gonna live their life. I believe if I've helped instill those qualities into them, they're gonna end up being better people. Sure. Right? I have a really, uh, I, I analyze my coaching in my life from a couple of very strong standpoints. One, my brother Ty, who passed away in 2014, he literally drank himself to death, right? And it was really unfortunate and it's a sad story because here's an ultra successful Pennsylvania high school wrestler that didn't have the college career that he wanted and he allowed that to affect his life moving forward, ultimately led to him to drinking himself to death at 43 years old, okay? So I look at every guy that comes into my wrestling room and I say, what if this is my brother? How am I gonna handle it? Sure. Right? I look at the way that my father reared me. My dad passed away when I was 20 years old at Oklahoma State, right at the beginning of my sophomore year. I look back on my life and I say, he was really hard on us. Right? Probably to the point where if my father were put under a microscope today, <laughs> right. he would say, he, he's, he's too harsh. Yep. He's too, well, for me personally, He is a major part of why I succeeded in life, not just wrestling. I Mm -hmm. succeeded in the sport of wrestling, but I feel like I'm a success in life because of the things that my father instilled in me, right? Mm -hmm. He made me gritty. When we came away from tournaments and he didn't think that I gave 100% effort, whether I won or I lost, the speech came, Right. right? He would also pat me on the back if I went to the tournament and he felt I gave 100% and maybe I fell short or maybe I won, he would pat me on the back, right? So I think those instances for me, the way that I was brought up and the experience that I've had, firsthand experience seeing my brother, has helped helped bring some of the coaching qualities out that I use now every day. I promise you, if you grabbed every wrestler that I've ever coached, any guy that's in my room right now, they're not all gonna say coach more He's great and he's doing things right. I feel like the vast majority would. Sure. Right? But at the end of the day, if we're coaches or we're leaders, right, even the bigger umbrella, if we're teaching young people how to become better people and we can instill those through the sport of wrestling, that's a win-win. Right. Right? And what does the next generation need? I just gave this speech at a Hall of Fame induction. I was a keynote speaker. And I said, You should well, have it down pat then, right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. I wish. <laughs> I, here was my message. We're all here tonight to celebrate the success of all of you as athletes and coaches. This is an amazing thing. What do I value the most out of what I think sport gives people? And this is what I've, at 40, how old am I? 42. It's hard to keep track. After 21, there's no good ones. At 42, I believe what has sport truly taught people. Right. Okay. This is going to get political. It teaches you how to accept losing and learn from losing. Right. Okay. If there's one thing that's glaring in American society at this moment in time, we have a huge part of the population that can't accept 
a loss. Right. They can't accept being told that what they think, feel, or want is not what the majority wants. Right. This is a value we need to grab a hold of. Okay. I agree. Because if we look at what we've done, this is just opinion, we've coddled for so long and told everyone, you're such a special individual, you're so special, and, and so the world should yes. think about your feelings every moment of the day. Guess what? The world doesn't care. Right. The world doesn't care what Teague Moore thinks or feels or whatever. I've come to accept even my own wife sometimes doesn't care. <laughs> right. Most of the time, probably doesn't care what I'm thinking I'm, or I'm feeling. With, I'm she on the says, same boat. <laughs> Get this done. Yeah. Right. right. So, can sport be the vehicle that helps a lot of people get there? I believe yes. Sure. If we're coaching right and leading properly, we can teach people that winning isn't everything. How you how you fight the fight mm-hmm. is very important. Absolutely. Right? There's, you, uh, so I'm going off on a tangent. You but go ahead. Sorry. No, I, I I just think that sport for me, because I've done it my whole life, it is who I am. It is what I am. But I do believe I am the person I am because of sport. Absolutely. And I hope that every kid that's coming through my room can take those intrinsic values and apply them to the rest of their life. I hope my kids at home can be a part of sports in any way, shape, or form and learn the things that are going to help them in life sure. because life is going to hand you bad days. Oh, yeah, right? for sure. I saw we were sharing um, our book list earlier, and yours is much more ex- extensive than mine. But um, I believe I saw 12 Rules for Life on yep. there as well. Okay, yep. so, um, and this isn't from the book, but uh, when Jordan Peterson was on Joe Rogan, I think two times ago or something, I can't remember which one it was, I actually came across the video separate from the podcast uh, okay and it's been since edited into like a five minute clip so you don't have to watch like the whole thing it's easy to find on youtube i'll show it to you later absolutely it is as a coach to me and i would say much more so with my crowd of youth than like a college kids right not that it's not applicable to them but the window for when this message is most impactful is going to be at that younger age and he gives this five-minute talk that basically breaks down why we say it's not important whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game. Yeah. And, you know, and I'm not going to do it justice, but to, to do a short summary is he basically says that to a 10-year-old, when you say that, they're going, wait, so if it doesn't matter if I win, why do we keep score? And you always tell me that I should try hard. Well, why should I try hard if it doesn't matter if I win? Right. What, and what he breaks it down into is, is – and. And this may be the way I interpret it because I'm a very, mentioned earlier, the OCD. Like, I'm not super OCD, but my mind works very much in compartmental hierarchies. Like, this, this, this. Step one, step two, step, step three. One, this, this, this. Before I go to two, before I go to three. Or value hierarchies, right? Like right. we talked about earlier. is right. um, I work backwards from the problem based on what it's ultimately trying to solve. And this is where I saw, and it resonated with me, was... You have to be think deeper because it's much more nuanced than the problem right in front of you. And that's what basically what parents do and coaches to a certain extent in youth do is they prioritize the next win over the long-term person. Right. And that's what he basically touches on is that you have games and you have championships and you have life. Each championship is made up of a series of games. And life is made up of a series of championships. Right. You never want to compromise your ability to win a future championship or win at life to win the next game. Listen up, Patriots. So, so exactly. <laughs> so, so his, he, he, he brought his kid into it. His example was on his kid's hockey team. He said there's a kid that's on the team, clearly the best kid on the team. Not even close. He's a phenomenal hockey player, right? So if you want to win the game, it's very easy. You just keep passing it to him, yeah. right? The problem is that by the time you get to the championship, there's going to have some team that has that as good a kid as that kid and then three more that are as good, and they play together, yep. and they play with the other kids, and, they all, and they're going to be, you're, they're gonna crush your team because all you've depended on is this one. You're one man. And so if you spend all season winning all your games based on something that's not a sustainable model, then you're going to do yourself a disservice in the future. And that's what I ultimately always come back to is 
when I look at why we're doing something, whether it's uh, how we run our practices, what I'm focusing on, uh, if I don't agree with a, a behavior that a kid has, like I go, okay, I'm gonna do this, but why am I doing this? Like, is this the right thing to do? Yeah. What am I trying to get out of this? Like, what am I trying to achieve? And, and I have to be aware, and we all have to be aware of that, it's not as simple as the next effect that it's gonna have, yeah. right? It's, it's the longer term effect. And I think that something that you touched on that resonated with me was about making people happy all the time. Yeah. And what I, again, back to our justifying everything in our minds, right? Is I've justified in myself that I do wanna make everyone happy. The problem is I can't make them happy all the time. Correct. But I think that I'm aiming to always at this imaginary point in the future where they will be happy. And they will come back and say, hey, thanks for being such an asshole too. Yes. <laughs> the, 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 the moment, it's it, really, really good point. Um, the video I sent the guys that day, yeah. my example was, I can go back and think of time after time that Coach Smith at Oklahoma State, mm -hmm. or my parents, in the moment said to me, you weren't your best because in the moment, I didn't feel good about myself. No. But you know what it did lead to every single time? The long-term me being happy with right. myself. Because my dad said, you did not give your best effort. Don't lie to yourself mm -hmm. and say that you did your best out there. Right. And at the moment, I was raging. Right. What do you mean I didn't try? What do you mean I didn't give my best effort? And then I looked at myself in the mirror and went, you know, I didn't. Right. I, I can do much better sure. than that. What is the long-term value? Right. I made the changes. You faced your, your fears. You overcame it. And then in the end, you are happier because of it. Right. Right? Absolutely. So there is, there is value. There, there is value. And I think that it's also, a, and there's so, it's so nuanced and there's so many things at play that it becomes hard to narrow down like one train of thought or one lesson that can be learned. Right. But, right. I mean, you're practicing too that like not everyone's nice. And you're gonna have, there's gonna be people that are very blunt and they don't mean to be mean. They're just being straightforward. And sometimes it's gonna hurt your feelings. And if you've never had your feelings hurt, because everyone's coddled you, like you said, and taking care of you, the first time you get your feelings hurt, it's gonna take you a while to get over it, to right? To get over it, absolutely. And my wife brought a good quote that she, in one of her sessions from this week at the conference, was she said that um, when you get knocked down, it's not whether you get back up. Everyone gets back up. It's actually how long it takes you to get back up. Everyone will get back up. Right. It just depends on how long it's going to take them. Right. And that's, that's something that I think is even more, like we said, everything be, is very nuanced. And you, you have to be able, in my opinion, to see things at a 10,000 foot view and then also be able to zoom in on them. You have to have a general idea of what you're talking about, what you're trying to do, but you have to have the ability to also focus in on one little part of that and yeah. tweak it and fix it or add to it or get rid of it or whatever is deemed necessary at that time. Yeah. Um, but man, to me, that's uh, another quote that I picked up that was in, in regards to that was also that it was from wrestling was, uh, you have to be your own toughest critic yeah. and simultaneously the first person to forgive yourself. And to me, that was like, hey, you just, I don't know if you watched the Jordan Burroughs video. Which one? There's so, so many. It was, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. The, uh, after his bronze medal match, Oh, like an interview one? I haven't watched yeah. any of those yet. So they ask him point uh -huh. blank, when you're in the match that you lose, yeah. when you're now in the Chimizo match and the, they challenge the call, he may be up 6-0. The call comes back, it's 3-3. Mm -hmm. And they said, what were you thinking at that moment? And he said, you kind of have to forget about it. Yeah. Instantly forget about it. right and I thought for, first of all Jordan Burroughs to me he's like one of my modern day heroes yeah because right? this dude gets it on so many different levels absolutely and it reinforces the fact that if things don't go your way if things don't go your way how quickly can you shift gears and make the next step about moving towards success and not looking back and saying, well, this is why I failed, right? Right. I think we can all agree the people that win a lot in sports have an uncanny ability to do that, right? Whether it's your Tom Brady's, whether it's your Jordan Burroughs's in wrestling, um, th there's a myriad of, of athletes that are out there that we can see it, right? The Ovechkins or the, the 
the Crosbys, they've found that niche within themselves that when things don't go their way, they can get back up real yeah. fast. And if there's one thing that Division One wrestling will help if you stick with it long enough, it's going to help you to learn that you have to do that. Now, right. how quickly do you pick it up? Do you pick it up your freshman year in your first semester? Or are you a fifth-year senior that figures it out as you're wrestling your last right. match and you're losing, but you figure it out, sure. right? And that is a value. That's a trait that... Um, I think we can all learn from, we can all try and practice in going back to what we were talking about earlier, whether it's parenting, husband and wife relationships, you can still apply that in those things. Yeah. Right. We have a disagreement. We have, we find fault with one another. How do you forget about it and move on to the next thing so that you can find success again? Otherwise you're just going to be remain pitted against one. Yeah. I, I think of it as a, uh, like a bag full of things, right? So like if you have this encounter, you have a situation, whatever it is, like you, you mentioned several different ones there, right? But you say you have an argument with my wife or say that you're Jordan Burroughs and you get a reverse call and it doesn't go your way, right? That bag is filled with everything that is involved in that situation, right? From good luck to bad luck to, you know what I mean? How much good luck did you have to even get you there to begin with? How much positive stuff is, even put you in that situation, right? You have all of that wrapped in there Plus the negative stuff, too, right? The things that are not going to be helpful moving forward. Right. But some of that negative stuff you you do need to take with you forward to remember not to do it again, right? Absolutely. So you look at this bag, yep. and you basically, like this, you got to look in this bag and decide what things you need to keep and what can stay in the bag, and the bag is thrown away. Right. I'm going to take everything with me that's beneficial. If it's not beneficial, then it's just weighing me down. It's yep. got to go. Yeah. And that's, that's a skill, just like anything else, right? It's a skill that is yeah. practiced, but... How, how many athletes have you worked with where they don't have a bag, they have a garbage truck oh, yeah. right. that they keep trying to drag along, right? And, <laughs> and you just say, and you know. They have one of those trains that you're sitting at for like five minutes. Like, how many freaking <laughs> how many cars, cars, cars do they have thing? full of stuff, <laughs> right? Um, and myself included, but sure, like, that is something that I really think the best are exceptional athletes, mm-hmm. right? whether it's business leaders, whether it's an athlete, that they can say, these are the things I need that are going to help me succeed and I'm moving on with everything else. I don't need it anymore, mm-hmm. right? And if you run into people that either fail on a regular basis or they can't find success, a lot of times it's because they continue dwelling on, oh, here we go again, right? right? Last time that I was in this scenario, bad call came my way and I referee... Yeah. Took advantage of that match too, right? right? So um, if if young people, whether it's a college wrestler, high school wrestler, youth wrestler, can learn that quickly, you're probably going to find success a little bit faster yeah. and not dwell on it. So you give up a takedown. David Taylor right now is the best example of first periods don't matter. Right. The match is not decided in the first period. Sure. He beat the rest of the world 37 to 0 in second period. Right. I haven't seen the statistics for the first period. You know why? Because they don't matter. It doesn't matter. He finished every right. match in his second period. But, and on top of that, you look at, from to look at it a little different angle, I look at someone like Kyle Dake, who didn't get scored on. Oh, man. And I got to imagine, I might be way wrong on this. I don't know. I got to imagine that wasn't one of his high priority goals going in no. to not get scored on. Right. If it was, he certainly didn't wrestle like it was. Correct. Right. And that's the point. Is right. You're going to get what you focus on. And if you focus on not getting scored on, you're not going to open up yourself a lot to scores. You know, your offense isn't going to be there as much. And you know as well as I do. Like, have you ever heard of this book called uh, Seeing Red Cars? I have not. I'll, I'll tell you the whole book in one sentence. You play golf? No. You ever played golf? I do. I hate it. Okay. What happens when you go to tee up at a golf course and you're hitting over a water and you just see how big this lake is? What do I do? <laughs> I swing and miss the ball, which is why I don't play golf. Well, the gist is that most people look at the lake and they see how much water is there. And then the ball goes into the water every time, right? I'm focused on the water. And the gist of the book is seeing red cars is there's not any more red cars than any other color car. But if, that's but if you say for. red cars, then all you'll see is red cars, right. right? You get what you're focusing on. And so when you go, well, I'm going to not get scored on, 
then your focus is defense. Right. And then what you get is scored on because you focused on getting scored on or not getting scored on, but it doesn't, our, our focus doesn't discern between whether we're looking at it as positive or negative. All we know is we're paying attention to it. Right. And that's what happens. Right. And, and so I think that, uh, you know, like you were saying is he, he kind of went, I believe, and wrestled a way that he thought was the best, most effective way to wrestle. And what happened was not getting scored on was a side effect was the of end that. result right. of him being focused on what he was. I, I totally agree. His semifinals match blew my mind. He was the Russian, right? Russian or Georgian? I think yeah. it was the Russian who had beaten him earlier. Mm-hmm. And in his interview after the fact, I love listening to these guys' interviews, you know, especially right in the I try to the figure out how I can done. brainwash my kids to think like that. To think like that, <laughs> right. right? Because if you... If you think like that, the wheels get put in motion to get yeah. similar results. Are we all going to be Kyle Dakes and David Taylor's, Jordan Burroughs? No, mm-hmm. but my four kids, if I can hopefully get them to hear, understand that, and begin to think like that, they got a better chance to succeed. Apply it to whatever you want. That's, apply was, it that's to their academics. Say. Apply it to They're going to be good at something. They're going to be good at something, right? Because with that mindset, they're going to figure out something that they go, I'm yeah. a lot better than this, yeah. at most, than most people. Yeah. And with this way of thinking, I can be really good. Absolutely. And whatever it's going to be is what it's going to be. Absolutely. I have... You got to get back? Well, I got I got 10 more minutes. So I got to... We can start walking back if you want. No, 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 no. I'm good. I'll just... I'll uh, shimmy back in the last few minutes. Um... We, are you sure we can start walking? Because i got to grab my bag and stuff. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Sounds good. So. I've, got, so I've got a grad class coming in. Um, there's a marketing professor that – there's two professors on campus I've developed relationships with. Mm-hmm. And uh, so there's a grad class that is working on marketing. They are going to help me try and find some ways to get more people into home matches. Mm-hmm. So I get five grad students. We meet once a week. Nice. Talk about – how can we get people more energized about AU wrestling? So today I get 30 minutes with them. We get we gave them some action items last week, or I gave them some action items last week. We'll come in, see where they're at, talk about how we continue to move forward. So um, that's really cool. Uh, well, those are those are um, Mike Moyer, National Wrestling Coaches Association. Your coach Brian Smith. Mm-hmm. These guys have provided for me the only reason why i've been in coaching now heading into 18 season at the division one level is because those guys have shared best practices right right and mike had said a long time ago if you can't do all the work find people on campus that are excited about it and that's what they want to do and then see how they can help your program yeah. and so this is one of the benefits that i have to it right now sure and that's uh something that i've because i have no formal education in business um but now here i am owning a business so it's just been trying to figure it out right and right. something that i've changed my perspective on a lot in the last three years is viewing things whether they are physical tangible things or whether they are characteristics or knowledge or skills as resources and as resources that can be traded and that can be bought and can be sold. And with that, what I look for is like, where we're at right now, I can't afford to pay assistant coaches very much money. Right. So when I'm trying to get qualified people to help me, I have to be able to get creative with what they're getting in return besides whatever the stipend the is for the month. Value. Right. Right. And one way I did that, and it's worked out very well, because my assistant coach, he's like my ride or die now. He's my sidekick. He's been with me for about two and a half years. But he started with me, I didn't pay him because he was a sports management major uh, and wrestling at a college right across the river in Illinois. And he had to do an internship for his capstone class in right. sports management. And he's like, how cool would that be to do my internship at a, at a wrestling academy? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. Let's do that. Yeah, because you're an intern. I don't need to pay you, which is good because I ain't got no money right now. So, uh, and then I said on top of that, what we're trading is I'm getting from you the things that you learned in your formal education of sports management. Right. Things right. that I may not be privy to. I know how to coach and I know how to do that, but you're getting a formal education from people who have studied this and written about it. I want to know about that stuff, but you're getting from me real world experience. I've coached for five years. I've coached for six years. I know certain things. Uh, on the reading list, uh, Elon's Musk biography, uh-huh. 
So that is a trait that Elon, people that surround Elon Musk say he is phenomenal at. He'll he'll hire someone who is exceptional at one thing. Yeah. And then they say he will pick their brain to the point where a week later, people can ask Elon Musk about something in that field and he can answer it because right. he's bled as much information out of that expert as he can get. Right? Yeah. Which ultimately makes him that even that much smarter right. than we know he is. Right. right. Because he knows I don't have to go through the years in the formal education to get there. Right. But if I grab the expert yep. and I can absorb as much of their knowledge as I can in a short period of time, it's like he's got the experience of it now. Yep. Right? Now, I'm sure there's naysayers out there that would say the guy's a fool and <laughs> he's just living living a lie and too many people are buying into it. But at the end of the day, he's one of the most inst- interesting people of our generation. I right would now agree. That we're seeing. I would agree. Right? I mean, well, think of just that. Just from the aspect of what we talked about earlier with the, uh, the road less traveled and that kind of characteristic of wanting to take a route that people I mean how do you as somebody like that there's no there's no path forged you know <laughs> there's no, no. there's He's, no pre yeah you, you're literally blazing the path right you're figuring it out on your own well you're gonna hear this TV real quick That's while right. you shut this down <laughs> you got the TV on playing some duels uh, yeah so I just the in our wrestling room here, um, this TV, I use YouTube all the time. Yeah. Um, and if it's not for instances like this that we can pull ex- real life examples up and have the guys watch, right. or um, what I'll also do is when I'm going through notes of matches, I will copy the video on my phone, I upload it onto my YouTube site, Mm -hmm. so I can create my own little clips of, guys, here's what we're gonna cover in practice today, here's five examples of how we wanna finish this single leg. Here's five examples of how we wanna finish front headlock. And it's it's extremely useful, man. Oh, for sure. So this is a tech, like this technology that uh, we've now had available to us, what, 15 years now, that I didn't grow up in wrestling rooms that had TVs with mm-hmm. VCRs or no. things like that. So this is something I was you, still ratchet strapped to the cart with the VCR on. Yeah, the train and they had to wheel, wheel it in from the from PE department, AV, <laughs> AV audio room, right? Um, and in my four years at Oklahoma State, Coach Smith, I don't think ever once put us in front of a TV and said, yeah. "This is how you do it," right. right? But I think it's it speeds that process of getting someone to understand what you're trying to teach because I can show an example of it on the mat, but not everyone's going to get it real life well if you show five examples there's gonna be five different people who are gonna do it slightly different slightly different and, and what one guy that has longer arms this is yep. how he does it versus mm-hmm. the next guy to the next guy so that's what I've definitely adapted uh, something that also has been an issue that I never saw coming when I started the, the Academy is that I have so many kids from different areas with different mm-hmm. skill sets and different knowledge levels but like they're all pretty good you know what I mean? But some of them don't have any idea how to hit a high crotch correctly. Right. Some don't know how to, you know, ride with, with their hips and their legs instead of just using all arms. Like, yeah. they all have different knowledge bases. And something that I developed, not because I thought it was necessarily best, it was best for whoever I have right now, is I generally will show things twice. The first, thing, the first time I show it is, like, very few details. It's just an overview of, like, two or three things. Focus right. on this, focus on this, focus on this. And then they'll have problems with it. And then we'll bring it back in. Well, now you have like a frame of reference. You've been in the position. You made some mistakes. Now you can look at details. Now you can understand with it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's helped us a lot. And and I just kind of started doing that over the last year or so. And it's helped out a ton. That That was a beautiful. Wicked headlock. Yeah. Was that the one where he did the duck under? Yeah. And then him. That was dirty. Yeah. Well, you got this appointment. We'll wrap it up. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Coach. Thank you, brother. It means a lot to me. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.